So these are folders it's called theta, right? And let me just show you a couple of files from these, right? It says, let's consider play with the files called theta uh, neurons in inhibition to cells versus theta two. Theta two means two theta. MATLAB doesn't like uh, when the uh, the uh, the file begins with uh, uh, a number, so you don't you don't do that. And MATLAB doesn't like hyphens either. So what you see. Uh, no surprise, right? Uh, the, we, we're going to consider just uh, inhibition between two theta neurons, and I click run. Right, and let me see what, what I show. So as you can see here, I have random initial conditions for two cells. So every time I click run, the picture this this picture is going to change, and that picture is going to change. But eventually, okay, click. Right, you see the cells begin almost together as the spiking cells, right? Synchronous spike in cell as time progresses, the phase log between the cells that it was around one, which means they're very close to synchrony. Okay, as time progresses, they go to to anti phase, anti phase, right? And if I keep doing this, right, regardless of how many how many times, unless I pick exact initial conditions, right, I'm gonna get the same the same uh, the same outcome. So anti phase bursting, right? If instead Right, I'm going to use excitation that regardless of what I do, I'm going to get synchronous state over and over again, which is kind of fine. But then I consider this time this neural network three cells, right? Same story, right? They are reciprocally coupled, and as you can see, I have for the cell number one, I have random initial conditions, right? And then let me click to see what's going to happen. Okay, I pick initial conditions for the other two cell, real very close to each other for a reason and basically what you can see here that okay these two cells you see now two lines okay so red line if you don't see it well again we can we can make it thicker by adding color color oops that's in russian color width so you can see better yeah. And then do it again over here, and only for the phase legs. Okay, and run it again. Oops, now it, it's unhappy. What did I do wrong? Let me see, it's unhappy. I messed up something. Color. That's kind of strange. Is it got to be with just a second? It doesn't like it, maybe because it should be. A, I don't remember that. It should be over here. Let me double check, comma. Color. No, it doesn't like it either. Yeah, that's what I sometimes I don't remember how to change stuff. Okay, how about now? It's going to be happier. Just a second, I'll, I'll figure this out. Oh, it's line. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 why it complains. All right, let's go back. To, it's not color. It's line. Oh, shame on me. Line. And then line here. Yeah, that's what happens when you teach on Saturdays. <laughs> All right, now you, you can see that. Okay, so no surprise that this uh, these two are going to be together. So uh, we have three cells, right? If I click this in and zoom the beginning of the story over here. Okay, we have green, blue, and red cells. And what I do, and the initial conditions of the green and red cells, 
are picked very close to each other, so you don't see the three of those, right? But then if I click here and I start scrolling to the right, now you can see some kind of greenish color, right? You see the greenish color, which means they uh, green and red cell because they inhibit each other. They try to repel each other, okay? And even though the phase difference between these two stay together, now you can see that there are two lines finally split. And as you can see, the green line, which is below, uh, is around at the value of 0.3, and this one is at the, at the level of 0.6, which basically means, okay, we use blue cell as reference cell and measure the time delay, so phase lag, between the green cell and the red cell. So you see blue followed by green, and then followed by red, and then blue again. So, so that's the period, but we can make it always one. And then the if it's one, then the delay between blue and green cells is one third of the period and two thirds of the period. OK, so if I keep running this over and over again, right, regardless of of what I try to do, OK, always OK, which is kind of surprised that all this green light is underneath the, the blue line. OK, so let's play this game and copy and paste right, and then make something like this. OK. So we have initial, so we have fixed initial conditions for the cell number three, right? And then use random initial conditions for the other, for the other cells, okay? And then we've got some initial transition, and then they converge to the steady state, and green is always below, okay? And which is, which is kind of surprising that, okay, now green is above, okay, finally, green is above the the, the red line which basically means, okay, if I zoom this in, it's a blue cell spike followed by the red spike and then followed by the green spike, which means, okay, so if I look at this picture, I have cell number one followed by cell number three and followed by cell number two, okay, and I do it again, and this time it's the other way around. It's a blue cell followed by green cell followed by red cell. Okay, let's do it 10 times. OK, so we have so now we have a one one score. We, we remember the previous uh, trial and this trial. OK, then OK, let's say it's one, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, oh, one, six. What's wrong with this? OK, I have no idea what's wrong with this, but let's do this, right? Make this one also random. We're going to change this to random so we don't have a fixed values and make it say whatever 10. I'm just making this up. I'll do it again. Okay. Okay, finally, one, one, two. So out of three, right, we have now red below. Okay, now two, two. Uh, th Two, two, three, two, four, okay, uh, three, four, okay, one more time, close, five, six. At bottom line, if you do this, you will see that, oops, uh, quit bug, do it again. If I do this over and over again, run it, no, not, not you, okay, I shouldn't click this. If I do this over and over again, then uh, it's going to be either clockwise rhythm or counterclockwise. And there is nothing else you can get from, from the circuit stably, right? So remember I, I mentioned that uh, in the post Q3 rebound, okay, if you have one-way connection, you always get a cycling rhythm in one direction, right? In this case, because of the reciprocal inhibition, you're going to have traveling wave moving clockwise and counterclockwise. And the chances are, because of the symmetry of coupling, that the chances are going to be 50-50 and nothing like that. And that's why we developed this two theta model. And the reason is because spikes are too fast. And then let me show you what uh, the, the other file over here, it's called theta two neurons, right? Okay, let's click on it. And also it has random initial conditions for now this is just two, no, two cells, three cells. Okay, it has three random initial conditions. 
and learn write this around this file. Let's see where is the outcome is. It's right here. Okay, and now you can see better. Remember, blue is reference cell. So by looking at this, you see it's a blue followed by red. That's why uh, the red line is below the phase lag. It's roughly at, at, at 1.1 1 over 3, which is 0.33, followed by the green cell, which is 0.666. So they evenly divide the period, right, into three parts. Okay, so, so that's a, let's do one more time. Okay, now this line switched the positions, which means it's a blue followed by red, followed by the green cell, followed by the red, as before. Okay, we, we've seen this before. And let's be patient, right? Let's click it again. Okay, traveling wave, traveling wave again. It wants to converge. Oops, don't do this, please. Okay, traveling wave again. Traveling wave again. Okay, P patiently click, click. We use Monte Carlo. Oh, now, now we have a game changer. You see the difference? This time, both lines converge to one half. One half means what? Look at this, which means green and red cell, they fire, they burst in antiphases, the blue cell. Okay, so you have another rhythm in the system when you have a blue cell fall, followed by green and red simultaneously. Okay, let's do it again. Almost the same idea, but now they diverge to become, uh, to, to generate uh, counter, uh, counterclockwise rhythmic outcome. Okay, patiently click again. Patiently click again. Patiently click again. So you basically use this Monte Carlo to tell what are the chances to get one rhythm versus the other. Okay, and now again close to one half. We saw that before. I just want to do it a couple of times more to see something else if it's doable. Okay, I can see the symmetry. Let me get rid of that. Do it again. No, no, no I'm not going to change that. All right, let's try to increase the coupling strength a bit. Oh, yeah, mostly. Most of, no, this is this is a different story. Okay, that's what I was looking for, and then we're gonna stop playing. So this time, as you can see, uh, then the blue and the green, the red cell fire together against uh, against the, the the green cell, which means you have stably how many rhythmic outcomes. So you have two traveling waves, clockwise and counterclockwise, and also you have three rhythms when one of the cells burst in antiphase with the other two cells of the network, which means potentially such a symmetric neural network made of three cells can, can generate five rhythmic outcomes depending on initial conditions. Okay, and that's basically the reason I'm going to close this. We develop we develop that uh, two theta formalism. So we can build up uh, a more complex neural network and use not highly detailed hodgkin the type of models, but um, kind of simplified, uh, simplified phenomenological models, but they still have the same properties as, as the, the biologically plausible ones. OK, so let's go back to the saddle node bifurcation okay, that we reviewed. And again, uh, what you see in the picture on the right, it's a saddle node, local saddle node, when you have dimension R3, so basically in addition to X, Y, you have a Z variable, and you want to make sure that the equilibrium state on the left, it's stable in all three dimensions, right? Whereas this still a saddle, and then they merge, and then you have this ghost of the saddle node, and the assumption is that this uh, trajectory, unstable uh, separatrix of the saddle, it comes back to the to the uh, to the node from the left, right? What's called nodal region, and and that was the result that uh, my dad, uh, that was a part of his PhD thesis many years ago, right? In 
<coughs> to when he defended it, that uh, he generalized uh, the sneak result onto high dimensional case, right? So, and and the, this bifurcation is called of code dimension one, and the idea is that if you put up slightly these outgoing separatrix, like uh, like like this or like that, but still it comes back from the node region. Nevertheless, as the cell node disappeared, you're still going to get a single periodic orbit, and that single periodic orbit is going to be stable. And that stability is due to the strong contraction that that orbit gains when it goes through the ghost of the cell node. This transition is very, very slow. That means you have plenty of time to uh, make sure that uh, the vector field has contraction. So basically, you, you he applied the technique of what's called uh, Banach contraction mapping to prove that the fixed point in that in that mapping on this cross section is unique. Okay, so that's a cell node bifurcation, a homoclinic cell node bifurcation in R three. Nowadays, everybody calls it a sneak. Okay. And then another bifurcation that I would like to kind of review quickly, it's called the homoclinic bifurcation of the saddle. So you have a saddle like this, right? And then the saddle has a homoclinic orbit. Okay, it has a homoclinic orbit. And what we need to figure out, okay, uh, what, how, how, what's the stability conditions on the periodic orbit uh, should be? I mean, what conditions are needed to make sure that this this uh, separate rich loop or homoclinic orbit results results in the emergence of a single periodic orbit, which can be either stable or unstable. So let's see. So first of all, we we truncate the equation. So we have linear part is x prime equals lambda one x, which means lambda is one is positive, which means in x direction the cell is unstable, in the y direction is going to be stable. Okay, which means this lambda two is going to be positive, and that minus makes everything stable. And then uh, what you do, you need to solve what's called a boundary value problem. You pick a small cross section here. When I say small cross section, I mean it's close to the origin, which means that uh, that yellow line, its coordinate is fixed. Y equals say d one. This d one is positive, but very close to the origin, which means it's it's small, right? And then you consider uh, analyze the behavior of trajectories near the saddle, how that that point that starts here, right, orig originates from that point, hits another cross section with the fixed coordinate, say x equals d2. D2 is also very close to origin, right? And what we need to find out at uh, this initial point, depending on the eigenvalues of the saddle, is going to be uh, kind of pushed towards the unstable manifold separatrix of the saddle is always going to push pulled away from the saddle even further. And what makes kind of one case stable, I mean, it's not stable, but still kind of stability bits and stability and vice versa. So first of all, we solve these linear equations, right? It's called initial value problem, simple as that, right? And then we can see those called boundary value problem. So all points, okay, for the X, as so you can see here, then uh, all points that originate here, X naught, will will vary, right? They're gonna end up on this cross section D, okay? And tau is the time that uh, it's needed for the solution to move from here to there, okay? And meanwhile, the second value condition is that all points on this cross section they have the same fixed initial condition D, okay? You call it D one. And then they're going to transition to the point Y1, okay, and using the same uh, using the same tau. And basically, we want to find how uh, Y1 this coordinate depends on uh, initial coordinate X naught. So that's what we're trying to achieve. So we use first equation to solve it for for tau, and it's easy to see that tau is going to be one over lambda one ln dx naught. And this is interesting, right? Okay, remember uh, that. Uh, so basically, what, what I can do, and that's very important, is that this tau looking right hand side, okay, uh, I can flip. I need x naught in in the uh, not in the denominator but in numerator. So I put a minus there and and flip the position of these arguments in the land, okay. And what I will see, and I just focus, I just want to see how tau depends on x naught, 
and I've got negative one over lambda one ln of x naught, right? And then you would say how tau, which is the time, can be negative with minus. But don't forget that x naught is much less than one, which means when we consider logarithmic function, we look at this negative uh, portion of, 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 of the function, which makes minus times that minus right positive, which means basically a tau is what's called proportional to ln of x naught. Okay, and this is a very important formula. So the closer x naught point is to the incoming separatrix of the saddle, the more time you need to transition from one cross section to another. So which means the closer you stay to the saddle, right, the longer you will transition. Okay, and that's very important, and that's a feature of of all of uh, all homoclinic bifurcation of the saddle, all transitions near the saddle. So, and then we plug this star into the first equation, right? And then la 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 la, a little bit of combinations, right? And what we find is that y1 is a function of x naught. So these are the constants. Y1 is a x naught uh, powered. To, to the gamma when gamma is called the cell index, right, which is lambda two over lambda one and the expression is positive. Okay, and what you see here is how y1 depends of x naught given that you have different gammas. So if gamma is greater than one, like, like two, it looks like a concave up parabola, right, then y1 is going to be less than x naught and why the, otherwise, if lambda if gamma is less than one, then it's going to look like a square root of two, right? Which means there is a vertical, uh, uh, there is a uh, infinite derivative at this point. Okay, and I go to this slide, and basically, this is needed to illustrate the following. So if I pick it, the same initial condition over here for two different saddles, so one saddle that has a gamma that is greater than one, okay, which means y1 point here is going to be closer to the to the outgoing separatrix of the saddle right here which means as you can see the vector field it looks like it it, it brings the trajectory closer to the saddle or closer to its outgoing separatrix okay this is true for the case when gamma is greater than one which means stability these are eigenvalues okay gamma Remember, it's a it's a ratio of these eigenvalues, this one versus over that. That's why it's greater than one, which means the negative eigenvalue on the left hand side is further away from the origin than, than the positive one. So if I introduce what's called saddle value, which is the sum of these numbers, that the saddle value is going to be negative, which means gamma is greater than one. Otherwise, if gamma is less than one, okay, then that case, then you see y1 is going to be greater than initial point x naught which means that distance is going to be greater than that distance, okay? And that, that's the case of the cell, positive cell value or gamma less than one, uh, the cell quantity, cell index less than one, which means in this case, instability, this one, right, due to this positive eigenvalue is going to be stronger than the stability. So that's why, again, that distance increases versus the case when that distance initial distance collapses and gets smaller near the saddle. And then, okay, and what you do next is, and then you need to find what's called the global transition from this cross section back to the original one, okay? So this is called the local map when you have X node move to transition to Y1 point, and then you consider the global transition Y1 point over here, then goes back to the next iterate X2 on the same on the original cross section, right? And then you just can see the linear map, just x2 equals dy1 plus dots, where d is some positive constant. And the reason why it's positive, because if it's negative, then this green orbit will flip over and lens over here, and it would cross the Hamaclean orbit, which is impossible in the plane. So that by, by the geometry of the plane, that constant e should be positive. Okay, and then when you combine both maps together, you're gonna get like something like this. Okay, that's your local map, and then you you plug, but instead of saying x2, you just say an x2 and x, x naught, you just say xn plus 1 versus the previous uh, it, uh, previous value of x, and then you've got a map like this, right? It's going to be some constant, we call this altogether a, 
it's going to be xn plus 1 equals some constant x to the gamma of n, right? And then you add the mu, it's called splitting parameter. So when you have a hemocleaning orbit, when the splitting parameter goes up, when the separatrix splits up inwards, this means mu is positive, right? Otherwise, it, it splits outwards, mu is negative, right? And then you can see that what's called one-dimensional map. And in case when uh, gamma is greater than one, you have the following. Before the loop, okay, when the, the graph of the map looks looks like this, right? You have not, no intersection with the 40 degree line, which means you have no fixed point. Then you have a fixed point at the origin that corresponds to the loop itself. And then when you shift it up, then you have a fixed point. And again, because of the slope, at, at the origin is close to zero. No surprise that this fixed point is going to be stable. Okay, that's how you prove the stability. And that basically means that uh, when you split, when you perturb the, the, the orbit inwards, right, then the separate converges to the stable periodic orbit, okay? Versus in the in a, in a opposite case, before the bifurcation, okay, you have no intersection points of the map in the 420 line, which is called co-web diagram or lamellar diagram, you know, all terminology. At the, then at, when mu equals zero, you have a single fixed point at the origin, which corresponds to the loop. And after that, you have this unstable fixed point. But, but remember, derivative right here is infinite, which means uh, it translates into the fact that this fixed point has a slope that is greater than one, which means that fixed point corresponds to the uh, repelling, unstable or repelling uh, periodic orbit in a plane. So that basically that's how the Hamaclean bifurcation works. And the reason why we need all this, because now we would like to uh, look at uh, the geometry of, of more uh, high dimensional models of individual neurons. In particular, we would like to uh, figure out what are the, the uh, ingredients, what the ingredients are needed to create interesting or realistic models of endogenous bursts, right? And we're still going to use the same geometric approach, okay? But this time our system is at least three-dimensional, right? Not two-dimensional, okay? So that this is manifested by the fact that we have X, Y, and Z variable, right? Z is on the horizontal axis and X and Y, I mean, or X you can call this V in the neuroscience context, right? This is Y, which is can be getting variable, right? And Z is on the horizontal axis, okay? Or X is just a vector. So all we need, we just need to subsystem, okay? X, which is include X and Y here, right? Or it can be a, a high dimensional vector. Uh, and we have a single slow variable. When I say slow, I mean that epsilon or here mu is a positive but small parameter. And for simplicity, okay? For simplicity, we're gonna assume yeah, that, that should be it, right? Maybe that condition is not necessary. Okay, so remember the uh, uh, Fitzgerald Goma model. We have this cubic null line, right, like that, right? And then we had this simple uh, orange straight line, and the intersection was the cubic state. And basically, whenever this the 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 line the lines across, uh, have an intersection in the middle of the uh, unstable cubic curve, then it will give you, a, it will generate limit cycle, right, by, I mean, again, through the intermittency of transitions, slow transitions along the uh, lower branch, fast transition over here, another slow transition along the uh, transfers to the upper branch and so forth and so on. But that's how it works in, in 2D. But once we in, have it in 3D, then this uh, this this cubic nucleus still remain one dimensional, which is made of the equilibrium state of the of the system. Okay, but this low nucleus that used to be a line is no longer in line, but it's some kind of two dimensional surface, right? And we need this surface to make sure that above that two dimensional surface that has again single intersection right here, just for illustrative purposes. Right, is that Z prime is going to be positive, so which means the solutions are going to uh, translate slowly along that branch to the right, to the knee point, then transition very fast uh, down to the down uh, to the lower branch, right, and then slowly moving along that branch, 
OK, where Z prime is totally negative, right? But then we'll figure, then we'll consider the interaction of what's going on. OK, so now let's talk about stability that we did before. OK, remember we said that earlier and in three dimensional case, it's no longer a surprise that whenever that yellow surface, slow null client, crosses transversely, OK, that one dimensional branch of the stable equilibrium states, right, over here, then this intersection where X prime, Y prime, and, o and Z prime equals zero, which corresponds to the equilibrium state of the full system. But because we are in three dimensional space, right, and therefore the eigenvalues of the equilibrium state, OK, you must have three eigenvalues, right, and the, we do know it's stable. And what's the difference between the previous case is that you still have a one uh, negative uh, small real eigenvalue due to small epsilon. As before, you have uh, one more negative real eigenvalue, but because you are in R3, now we have another one. So now we have three. And when you shift this surface right up, uh, then clearly something is going to happen over here, right? So the equilibrium state must lose stability, but because we still have the same uh, single intersection right there, so you don't lose the equilibrium state, so it should become unstable somehow. And it's the same, it's the same, it's the same idea. What happens is that as as you shift this uh, slow two-dimensional null line up, okay, one of these eigenvalues, right, it will one stays there, the other one is, is going to slowly move to the right, okay, then it's going to become of the same magnitude as epsilon, then they be become double root, then they become complex conjugate, okay, and then they're going to cross the imaginary axis, right, which corresponds to the Andron of Hopp bifurcation, whether it's a subcritical or supercritical, okay, then they cross the imaginary axis, then they land on the real axis again, and then they split like that. Okay, but the fact that you have this eigenvalue basically means that, okay, that th this point in the middle, it's unstable still, right? But it has a different type. Before it was totally repelling, but now because of the eigenvalue on the left, then this point is a saddle. And that's a big difference, right? And that's a huge difference. Okay, so one more time, recap. When the intersection occurs on the lower branch, the equilibrium state must be stable. And then it transition through the Andron of Hopp bifurcation, and basically, uh, okay, to to make the equilibrium state a saddle, okay, and right and very close to the transition, you have a saddle focus. By the way, okay, so now let's just we've got this point right, and now let's review our options, okay, let's review our options. What can we have in this particular case? So we still have this same configuration, right? S shaped curve like this, or Z shaped curve. And let's imagine that in a in a two dimensional fast subsystem due to this equation, okay, this one. Let's suppose we have right right here we have a, an Andronov Hopp bifurcation, okay. There we go, an Andronov Hopp bifurcation right here, which could be either supercritical. OK, like that, or it can be subcritical, which means it, it, it's uh, yeah, some unstable limit cycle collapses into that equilibrium state. But before it emerges through the double loop, double uh, periodic orbit. And, and regardless of, right, if I pass by the Andronov Hopp bifurcation, right, then uh, the equilibrium state is no longer stable here and it's going to be surrounded by an uns by a stable limit cycle like that, right? Okay. And again, in this particular case, what I do is that I make epsilon zero, which means I freeze the slow uh, system. Okay. So z z prime now is zero. Z becomes a parameter, and what I do is that I use z as a parameter to investigate to study. The Andronov Hub application. Suppose it's supercritical for simplicity. Okay, so for some z, I have a small limit cycle. I increase the limit cycle, increase in size, 
increases in size, right? And then that limit cycle, it kind of uh, traces out a two-dimensional surface, cylindrical surface, okay? You see this bottle? This is just an illustration of the case when the Andronov hell bifurcation was subcritical. So, the, so the, the the bottle, the bottom part of this of this bottle, right? It's kind of concave concave in, right? And then this is this is the double loop, right? And then you have this surface that is uh, foliated by the stable limit cycle, Some, something like that, okay? Somewhat like that. And let's also suppose that. Uh, if you keep increasing this parameter z, then the periodic orbit, like in, in a in a Fitzgerald-Gumer model, changes its mind and then collapses back uh, to the uh, equilibrium state through the reverse andronov hopp bifurcation like that. Okay, it's just uh, again in the, in the case when uh, epsilon is zero. Now we make make epsilon uh, positive but small. So, which means we no longer have a frozen system, right? Now, Z becomes a dynamical variable. And what's going to happen is that, okay, if I start over here, okay, then I move along that branch, do, 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 right? Come to the knee point, okay? Apparently, in my case, epsilon is not really small. And then, before, I landed on a, on a, that red, branch, right, which is, was uh, in the case of the fitzgerald goma but this time I can't reach it first of all because it's unstable, and secondly, it's bounded by that surface made of the uh, uh, limit cycle of the fast subsystem. So I land on it, right, and then I converge to the limit cycle, but again, let's assume that this low null climb, which is two-dimensional surface, is placed so that it's definitely above this knee point, Right, but but underneath that uh, that surface over here, which means above it, z prime is positive, below it, z prime is negative, which means I keep turning around that two-dimensional surface, slowly transitioning to the right, okay, to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right, and then uh, the diameter of the surface narrows down, and then you come back to you converge to the stable equilibrium state here, right. And then you have you create this cycle, right? And you're gonna get a trace in voltage and time that's gonna look like this, right? Slow transition, then you land on the surface, make a number of revolutions, right? And then you reach the uh, the reverse under one of hot bifurcation like this, and then you follow this one-dimensional branch like the Fitzgerald-Guma model, right? And then you fall down to start the cycle again, and then you get oscillations that. Again, in neuroscience context, known as a plateau like burster. Okay, so it's endogenous burster, right? It's a two dimensional, it's a three dimensional dynamics. It has two slow phases this slow phase, active phase, slow inactive phase, and then fast spikes in between in this configuration. Okay, and what you see on the right is, is a particular example. Okay, that it's called the Hinmarsh Rose model, and we're going to talk about in details about that model next time. And I'll also show you some more examples. Basically, it it it, it shows you uh, how these phenomenological right ideas can be translated. I mean, not don't translate it. Nobody planned to do that, right? Okay, Hinmarsh and Rose they try to create a model of endogenous burster, and in one configuration, it's going to look like this. Okay, so it's going to give you oscillations that look like plateau-like oscillations. I mean, it, life is a little bit more complex, but we'll talk about this later. Okay, so okay, so what I'm trying to do is that I I want to make sure that I need I need to get this two-dimensional surface, and we're, we're going to call this spiking manifold, two-dimensional spiking manifold, and I need to terminate it right somehow. And what options do I have? Okay. And one option that I have is that, okay, I either start through the sub, uh, subcritical under of hope, right? So the, the surface is going to work back like that, or I'll, I'll start like shown here, supercritical under of hope application, okay? It shows that I'm affiliated by the limit cycle of the fast subsystem. Keep moving, and th this time, I want to make sure that I don't collapse back 
onto the this top red curve. So, but I need to terminate that that bottle somehow, right? And how I can terminate it? Basically, what happens is that that two-dimensional surface, right? It keep growing in size, and then it touches the middle branch of these uh, S-shaped curve, right? Or cubic nucline. And what is this? Okay, remember we said that uh, the point where it touches, right? It's a saddle, and therefore the edge of that surface, right? It corresponds to a homoclinic bifurcation of the cell we just discussed. Okay, so this is a homoclinic bifurcation that occurs primarily in a in a in a in a, in a fast subsystem. Okay, that's why I put homoclinic bifurcation. And again, this is another example from the from the uh, hindmarsh rose model. Okay, that's what you see over here. So it has x equation, y equation, and z equation. And as you can see, the z equation, like we discussed before, okay. Uh, it doesn't the epsilon, then s is just just a number, and then you have x minus x naught and z, which means it's a linear relationship between z and, and x, which is straight line. But because we are in 3D and there is no y variable, therefore this line in three-dimensional space should be uh, viewed as not a line, but it's a uh, infinite in a y direction, which means it's a plane. Okay, so it's going to be a plane like that. Okay, and if it's true, then if it's true, okay, then uh, if if this plane, this red uh, <coughs> orange plane, is again above this knee point and strictly below this touching point over here, which means z prime is positive above and above this null line and negative below this null line. What I'm going to see, I'm going to see something like that. OK, let me show it to you. Let me start over here, right? Then I transition along this uh, branch, stable branch, right? Slowly. And then I keep moving, right? Because again, my epsilon is not that slow enough. But then I realized that, OK, I, 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 I moved above this Z prime, where Z prime should be positive. And then I land on this two dimensional surface and I start turning around like this. Right, and slowly transition towards the edge of this manifold. Transition, 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 and then I lose this two-dimensional manifold, okay, and fall down back onto this branch, hyperpolarized branch of this endogenous burster, and my voltages are going to look like this, okay, and this is called square wave burster. So this has square wave. And as you can see, uh, there are two couple of things that you should uh, be aware of. OK, first of all, as you can see, the spike frequency in the burst over here, it's higher at, at the beginning, and then it becomes slower. And why it's slower? Because remember we said as we approach the hematinic orbit, we pass closer and closer to the saddle, then transition through the saddle takes longer. And that's why the inter-spike interval gets wider. OK, so basically uh, this is an indication that if I if I didn't see this picture before, right, this indication that the, the surface is going to end up terminate through the homoclinic bifurcation. There's another uh, thing that I have to keep in mind. Remember, we said that this this surface is foliated by a stable limit cycle of the fast subsystem stable, which means if I want that surface end up terminate through the homoclinic uh, bifurcation, right? Then I have to move backwards over here. OK, and consider this case, right? Again, stable limit cycle should terminate at the homoclinic bifurcation, which means the saddle index here should be greater than one, which means the separate tricks. No, the uh, saddle value, where is it? I forgot, hey, where is it? Yeah, that cell value should be negative, which means I must have this case, right? So which means the closest to the imaginary axis in the fast subsystem, right, should be a negative positive eigenvalue, right? So that sum should stay negative, right? That's how you uh, play what's called a, it's called bifurcation, uh, uh, bifurcation puzzle. 
So all pieces of the puzzle should get together. So the fact that you have a stable orbit over here implies that when you uh, compute the eigenvalues of a saddle here at, at the fast subsystem, it's it's the the eigenvalues of the linearized matrix must be of a specific type. So negative eigenvalue must be uh, have as must be uh, more negative than the positive one. So to make sure that the cell quantity is positive. Okay, that's what you're going to get together. Okay, in this particular case. It's one way, it's one configuration of a square wave bursters. Okay, again, I don't I don't need this this equation. Hin Marsh rules is just a, it's a it's a, it's another uh, illustration of this phenomenological scenario that begins with the Andronophob bifurcation, whether it's again subcritical or supercritical, right? But that surface terminates through the homoclinic bifurcation in a fast subsystem. As a result, you're going to get what's called square wave bursters. All right, okay. So, that's it. So now, let me just one more time to illustrate what I just said. Okay. So the, there are a couple of things that I, I need to tell you too. So, so first of all, okay. Uh, let me do this. Right. This is true when epsilon is zero. So again, z prime is zero. Z becomes a parameter, and then basically I affiliate it. I, I took a knife, right, and cut this two-dimensional picture in, I slice it into the two-dimensional uh, slices, right? So if I consider this slice, what do I see here in X, Y plane? I can see that before the bifurcation, all trajectories in the fast subsystem converge to this stable focus. Okay, then I transition through the Andronov hop bifurcation, I skip this part, and all I see that the, the equilibrium state of the fast subsystem becomes unstable, and then it's surrounded by a stable limit cycle. And that limit cycle, if I keep increasing Z slowly, right, it's going to trace down the surface. And then I will see around this value that, oh, all of a sudden, I have not just one equilibrium state as before, but I have two more that bifurcate through the, uh, emerge through this cell node bifurcation. One of them is saddle, one of them is stable. This is called depolarized equilibrium state. This is hyperpolarized equilibrium state. It's stable. This one is, is no longer stable, but unstable. And they're separated by the stability of this orbit, periodic orbit, and stability, and the base of attraction of this stable equilibrium state separated by incoming separatrices of that saddle. And then if I get closer to the end, to the end of that surface, right, at the very edge, okay, this stable uh, limit cycle increases in size and becomes a hemoclinic orbit of this saddle. Okay, and after that it disappears. Okay, so after that we have unstable, we have an unstable uh, equilibrium state up here. Oops, sorry. Right, and then settle and stable that one. And that's actually a picture that illustrates this hemoclinic bifurcation in a in a hin rose model. So again, this point corresponds to that point, which is stable one, right? It doesn't have complex conjugate eigenvalues. You see it's just a stable node. You converge to it monotonically without any oscillations over here. This equilibrium state is unstable. You spiral away and then you converge to this limit cycle, green one, that is soon to become a hemoclinic orbit to this saddle. Okay, this just shows the two-dimensional slice from the hill marsh rose model. Okay, good, right? So now we have this puzzle all together. And what if we, we say, OK, but what if, OK, we look at this saddle over here, right, like in the previous case, and what we find is that the the cell value of that saddle is no longer negative, but it's positive, which means that limit cycle, stable limit cycle may not terminate at the saddle. So what we can do, right, and the, one of the possible solutions to this problem is that before, okay, that surface that we end up before that just terminates at the homoclinic bifurcation, what that surface does, okay, it has another trick. That surface drops back like this, right? And then it's on, it terminates at the, uh, at the homoclinic orbit of the saddle that has positive cell quantity. And interesting enough, what it, what it draws back, what does it mean? That means there's another branch of limit cycles, but this time they are unstable. 
So that's your old stable limit cycle inward limit cycle, right? But now you have another limit cycle that is unstable, and it, 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 we, we need it to satisfy uh, conditions on the on the eigenvalues of the saddle. So again, these are fold here. Again, this is just illustration from my old papers uh, showing uh, how this should look like for, I mean, again, for for mathematicians, right? Again, non farm bifurcation, super critical. Okay, then this uh, dropping point, right? And then uh, uh, that after that, the surface touches the saddle over here. What I didn't, what, what I made a mistake here, you see, I, I, I used this low nook line, I illustrated, I placed, I uh, showed it as a, just a straight line, but it's not true, right? This should be a two-dimensional surface, okay? And again, it's just, at that time, I kind of missed that point. So the other thing that I, I want to bring in, in, into account is, let me go over here, okay, this was showing here, okay, that, that, curve that is called as a uh, gravity center of the periodic orbit. So the idea is that when you're in the periodic orbit right here, okay, you move on this periodic orbit, and then you can find its gravity center. So you have to find average uh, the coordinates of the limit cycle over the period. And when it just bifurcated from the equilibrium state, then the gravity center of this limit cycle is going to be right in the middle. But the point is that remember I said that as you approach the saddle, you're going to spend more more in time around the saddle, which means that curve, the special curve in R3, is going to bend and is going to enter the saddle point at the vertical slope, okay, over here, and that's going to be important for us in the future, right? But maybe today it's not that important, okay? This just another illustration of how that average curve is going to look like in three-dimensional case for the for the uh, when the the surface has what nowadays we call a Mexican heart, sombrero. Okay, so you have a, it's called a Mexican heart. Okay, when it drops back and then touches the uh, uh, saddle. But you see it, it enters the saddle almost vertically, it's vertical, uh, vertic uh, infinite derivative. And that's a feature of the hemoclinic bifurcation. So I guess it's just another example of what we can uh, construct or imagine how the neural uh, neural, how these critical manifolds, they're called critical manifolds, uh, in, a two in, a, in a slow fast system may look like. Again, the reason why they call critical, because I said earlier that this is the frozen system, and then you release, you make epsilon uh, positive but small, and then you have dynamics, right? And how dynamics is going to look like. Say, I start around this surface, right? Uh, around this initial condition. I spiral onto the equilibrium state, maybe not spiral, just converge to the equilibrium state, and, and then I sh sh shift slowly to the left, right, along that branch, get to the knee point, and then I take off and land on this two-dimensional surface where Z prime is positive, right? And then I keep turning around this surface, keep going, keep going, keep going, and then I reach that subtle node bifurcation in the fast subsystem for the periodic orbit, where I lose the well, I lose the stable stable branch, right? And then I make another turn and then land back on the surface. Okay. As a result, as a result, regardless of whether I have a hemoclinic bifurcation at the end of this, that's where my voltage in time is going to be. But as I said earlier, for hemoclinic bifurcation, it's 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 very typical that you have these. Uh, the distance between the spikes at the very end of the burst increases. It basically indication of the fact that you have a hemoclinic bifurcation that terminates that surface. And again, the reason, remember I said, because tau, the dwelling type by the saddle, right, increases as you approach the saddle point, okay, which means this time increases as you approach the, the hemoclinic bifurcation or hemoclinic orbit, okay, that's the indication that the hemoclinic bifurcation terminates. Whereas in this particular case, right, you don't see any 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 uh, substantial increase in the interspike interval by the end of the burst. Okay, again, this is a hidden marshall rose model trace that has this kind of scenario. Okay, and again, uh, some people call this uh, burster. Uh, 
due to the uh, ending phases of the of the of the burster. So this is fault, and this is whole homoclinic. Some people call that uh, classification the classification type of this burster is fault homoclinic. Okay, whereas that one is going to be then fault, but this is fault for the equilibrium state, and this is fault for the um, periodic orbit. In Fitzgerald Agoma, it could be fault, fault, right? In this case, it's a fault for the equilibrium states and fault for the periodic orbit. And that's how the surface is going to look like uh, when I, uh, no, the trace is going to look like in case of the, well, in the second case, you don't see any uh, substantial increase, but you can see that part. You see that because it ropes up, so it kind of bends up uh, by extending the, the, the manifold. That's why you have increase of in the size of the spikes by the end. Okay, it's just indication of the fact that it ropes back and a particular type of the bifurcation that terminates the burst. Okay, and voila, right now we have this geometric, uh, geometric toolkit. So now by we can we can imagine various uh, bifurcation scenarios in the fast subsystem that can produce different types of neural activity. Okay, for example, that's why I said the homoclinic, uh, why we, the reason why we studied the uh, homoclinic cell node. Remember that green surface, right, it ended up in the middle of this branch, right, which corresponds to the uh, homoclinic bifurcation of the cell. What if, okay, at that point, slowly shifts, shifts, right, and, and, adds, and, and terminates at the knee point, which means it, it has no way to go anymore, right? So that's a homoclinic cell node bifurcation. But then you lose the hysteresis, right? If you start over here, where are you going to go, right? Because you just stop uh, and you're gonna get, you, won't, you won't be able to get a burst in the following configuration. And to get a bursting activity, you need to change the shape of the stonic spike and manifold. This time, okay, it's the same, it's the same construction, right? You have a S-shaped curve, okay? The green surface ends up through the uh, homoclinic cell node, sneak, but it's imperative this time to have it at the beginning the uh, subcritical andronophile bifurcation. You need instability, right? You, you want to make sure that the surface is made of stable and unstable sections. Okay, so this is unstable section, this is stable section, and if I place my slow node client, which is two-dimensional surface, right in the middle of, above this stable section, right, so what I'm going to get? I start over here, converge to this acquiescent hyperpolarized state, right, then I move, move on, right, then I transition to the surface, so I have a long interspike interval at the beginning due to the cell node, right, then spike frequency increases, increases, and then I reach to this fall point, and from that fall point, I converge to this stable equilibrium state over here, then transition like, like that, and then I lose the unstable branch, unstable branch spiral away, land on the, on, on, on that uh, hyperpolarized branch again. So that's how my voltage in time is going to look like. And surprise, surprise, that's exactly the uh, the configuration that we see in one particular specific uh, uh, biologically plausible 14-dimensional Hodgkin-Huxley type of model that describes dynamics of pyramid cells. Okay, so and 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 again, depending on 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 perturbations, depending on the drive, depending on a, uh, some parameter variations, this model produces either tonic spike in activity like that, and then it generates uh, module the module to spike in activity like this, right? Or burst in activity like that. That's exactly the scenario that I described. Look at this. You, you start over here, okay? Then this is sneak, like we said before. So this, uh, and then you turn around this manifold, and then there's a fold point over here, as you can see it here, right? And then from that fold point, you collapse onto the branch of the equilibrium states, transition through to start a game again, right? So that's just another example. Uh, it's again, it's this on the left hand side is just a phenological scenario, but that scenario is was in, not, I don't want to say implemented. 
it was observed in a in a very specific 14 dimensional pyramidal cell model right and i developed a technique that basically allows you to reveal this the topology of these manifolds okay and then to conclude let me just show you a few slides uh, that kind of uh, would serve as an introduction to the last four uh, fourth series of lectures. So this picture you've seen before, and and these are the corresponding Hochi Hasty type of uh, model. Okay, so you see the stable uh, stable part of the surface, right? This one, and then it rolls back and touches this saddle over here, which has specific uh, uh, eigenvalues at the cell, right, to make sure that cell quantity is positive. And that's how the bursts are going to look like in this particular case, right? And then we'll try to, I'll try to explain to you that uh, depending on the on the position of this low and null line, okay, rather than having just a single burst like that and nothing else, the same model can produce a bursting activity like this, right, as before, but in addition, it can produce tonic spike in activity that corresponds to this limit cycle on the left. So the system can be bistable. And clearly, if you have two attractors, there must be something in between them, right, that separates the base of attraction. So these two, uh, these two pictures, okay, again, these are critical manifolds for specific hodgkin hasty type of models. I don't want to go into, I mean, what kind of neurons they describe, but they, they show you that that uh, the surface truly may originate through the subcritical and one of our bifurcation, then it rubs back like this, right? And they become the surface, right? Oh, that's what I said before. This is the also unstable part of the surface. Okay, then the stable part of the surface, right? And then you see it, this one, it, it, I mean, again, you don't see this well, but again, it rubs back again to touch the cell branch. So again, this works just just fine in the Hochi character type of models, but it, it takes it takes some energy, skills and efforts, right, and knowledge to reveal the topology of the critical manifolds in, in these models, right? Okay, and that's another example. That we, we talked about this before. This is mathematical example. We create this kind of folding point that I keep talking about over and over again, right? So, and rather than I just focus on that part, just to tell you that it doesn't show how the surface begins, but let me just show you that it starts like, uh, again, on the of bifurcation. I don't really remember whether it's a subcritical or a supercritical, right? And then it rolls back, right? And then touches the saddle, right? And this is the average val voltage value, right? And this is very important to understand the average dynamics of the system, right? And that's how, this is actually a six dimensional actually model of Perkinja cell, right? And then it's, a, again, this is, uh, two-dimensional projection of three, it's a two dim three-dimensional projection of two-dimensional manifold of six-dimensional system. And let me just tell you that you can have canard solutions right on the edge, right? This is a two-dimensional torus. And to make, to complicate things, right? And to make them un un unimaginable, let me just say that the torus can be stable, but can't, it can't be of a subtle type as well, right? And again, in, in the last, uh, series of lectures. We'll discuss two simple models. Okay, again, this is a, it's called reduced leech uh, interhard neuron. Okay, again, and run of our bifurcation, right, then robs back and touches and robs around this manifold to end up through the homoclinic cell node. Okay, and depending on the parameters, okay, it can produce various kind of dynamics, right, and including uh, chaotic bursting and chaotic spiking. And this uh, this model, it can produce tonic spiking activity, as you can see it, right? That's square wave bursts. And in between them, these are interesting transition, right? It can, uh, it, it, the, the, the behavior can be chaotic, right? You see, it, modulatory dynamics due to tutorial, right? That's square wave bursts and switches back and forth at the transitions. Okay, so it, it is imperative uh, to know, reveal the uh, topology of the critical manifolds. Okay, and it's another simple example that we discussed. You see, it's, it's called Fitzhugh-Naguma plus John Rinzo uh, added up another equation over here. So it's it's an old two-dimensional equation that corresponds to this cubic node line. And now you have three-dimensional system that has this characteristic fold. Okay, and this 
this this model was supposed to produce what's called a uh, elliptic bursting activity that can be either regular, which means you have burst that always have the same number of spikes and uh, some same number of substantial oscillations. All these numbers can vary, so therefore the dynamics can be chaotic. OK, so at this note, I would rather stop. And let me see. Um, just want to show you some. OK, so. Um, if you happens to, I mean, again, let me see quickly, quickly. Sorry, interrupting you. Uh, all right, hey. Just sorry. I remove this part. Okay, that's my web page. If I click this picture, basically it, it shows you another example of the critical manifold. In this case, it's a 14 dimensional uh, model of a, a leech heart into neuron, right? And again, it's a very interesting. As you can see, the subcritical uh, unknown of hope then fold due to the boat in bifurcation, right? Then uh, that surface, right? Uh, cylindrical surface becomes a mirror band. So it's, it's very interesting from a mathematical point of view, again, especially if you're interested in topology plus dynamics, right? It can be, it can be very, very interesting. By the way, I'll just show you a few examples. You see that fold, okay? Fold over here under one of our bifurcation. Okay, now if I use this projection, right? I still have a fold, subcritical under one of hop fold, but then I look at this picture and you, you would say, hey, it doesn't look like the previous one, but the truth is that it's the same picture uh, when I looked at this manifold from different from different uh, dimensions, right? From different from point of view. So again, this is under one of hop bifurcation. So in a, in a 2D, uh, when the limit cycle emerges from the equilibrium state, it always surrounds it. But if you look from a different dimension, it doesn't have to surround it, right? It's kind of on the side. And the fold that will look like a dropping point, right? You see, this is a real fold, right? It doesn't have to be drop up or drop down, right? That's a fold. So it, this basically allows you to determine uh, the, uh, the dimensions or the variable that actually uh, uh, determine the bifurcation in a 14 dimensional system. You got to understand that cell, cell node bifurcation of equilibrium state is a one dimensional bifurcation indeed, right? Or Andronov hub bifurcation typically occurs in two dimensional system, okay? Which means if you have 10 dimensional system, you only need two variables that would give you the Andronov hub bifurcation and the other eight are unnecessary for that particular kind of uh, bifurcation, right? Yeah, you're welcome to 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 glance through these pictures just to show. I mean, it shows you a zoo of possible uh, topologies that neuronal models can have, right? I just showed you just a just a few. Okay, on this note, what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna uh, show myself, right, that I'm still around. It's not a robot talking to you, and I'm really tired at this point. And today is a Saturday, right? And I guess this should be enough for today. And you have a first project, right? And once we finish, uh, I can tell you what the next step is going to be. And that's basically it, right? And then if you have a question, please unmute yourself and ask it. So if you don't have any questions, I still have, I can see we have seven students today. So thank you for joining me. And I hope you like mathematical neuroscience as a field, right? And then I wish you a great weekend and bye bye, guys. See you next week then. Goodbye. Есть вопрос. А то есть вы сказали, что нужно первую часть сначала сделать, потом написать, и вы скажете о дальнейших шагах. Нет, они вы будете совместить вместе. Просто это это начало, чтобы вам было чем заняться, чтобы а под... Я не знаю, где мы закончимся, поэтому я не могу сказать, что будет во второй части. Это не вторая часть, это продолжение первой части, они органично связаны, но э, поскольку я не могу сказать, когда, на чем мы закончим, поэтому я не могу assign вторую часть, часть сегодня.
Ага, все, понятно. И мы будем фокусироваться на вот то, что я сегодня говорил, на, 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 на топологию этих многообразий, как они определяют, how, как они shaped нейронную динамику и прочее, прочее. И теперь вы видите, что топология и динамика, они связаны между собой в нейронных моделях. Вот. На этом все. Я очень рад, что вы здесь, и я рад, что мы закончили. И я могу, могу пойти домой теперь. Спасибо, до свидания. До свидания. Спасибо. Всего, всего доброго, молодые люди.